Well, good evening, everyone, and um, a warm welcome to the second of our online Eco Church sessions. We're so pleased to welcome back those of you who joined us in September and also to welcome people who are joining us for the first time this evening. As many of you know, my name is Eileen. I'm a member of Beulah URC in Cardiff, and I'm the Green Advocate for the Synod of Wales. Currently, the Wales Synod is working towards becoming an eco-synod and um, is also hoping that many local churches will want to engage with the eco-church scheme. So far, there are five churches within the Synod who already have eco-church awards, and we're very pleased and grateful that representatives from those churches are with us this evening and are acting as facilitators in our breakout rooms. As a means of supporting and encouraging each other through the Eco Church journeys within the Synod, we felt it might be useful to get some fresh ideas and starting points for action. We're hoping that this series will provide information and enable discussion around steps that churches may like to consider taking. And each session is focusing on a different area of Eco Church, one of the five different areas. In September, with Caroline Pomeroy from Climate Stewards, we considered how important it is for us as churches and also as individuals to consider carefully our lifestyle choices and the impacts that they have on our planet and on its poorest communities. And we spoke particularly about calculating, reducing and um, offsetting our carbon footprints. This evening, we're thinking about community and global engagement, and we're delighted that Cullen Cloyd, who is the acting head of Christian Aid in Wales, is able to join us, and we're so very grateful to him for giving up his time to be with us here tonight. After we've listened to Cullen's talk, we'll move back into our breakout rooms, as Jason said, to consider some related questions. And then there will be a five minute tea break and we'll gather together again for discussion and final reflections. So it's always a privilege to hear Cannon speak and to share his thoughts. And so I'm really pleased to hand over to him now. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Eileen, and thank you, everyone, for your warm welcome. And um, it's uh, great to be here with you uh, virtually uh, in the Zoom room. Um, and I have got a PowerPoint, if we can have that up, Jason or Adrian. Lovely. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak with you uh, this evening. And on behalf of Christian Aid, and in particular Christian Aid Wales, I want to thank you as a, a denomination, uh, as churches and as individuals for your faithful and generous support towards the work of Christian Aid um, every year, but in particular this year, which has, of course, been a challenging year for all of us and it's only through standing together with people like yourselves we can reach out and support and strengthen the world's poorest communities uh, it's only because people like you give act and pray with christian aid and our partners um, we can stand together hopefully uh, with communities from Nicaragua to Malawi to Syria. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you in particular for inviting me to talk tonight as we look uh, on um, global community, uh, global work, uh, and in particular uh, with emphasis, of course, on climate justice, because that is so uh, important and so central to the work of Christian Aid, especially uh, as we um, move on to next year and the next 18 months um, leading up to COP26 in Glasgow next autumn, of course. So thank you. Uh, it's great being here with you. Well, the world is becoming increasingly aware of the plight of planet Earth and the, uh, and the climate. Uh, we've seen that through the um, school strikes um, over the past year or two years, uh, started by Greta Thunberg, of course. Governments around the world uh, are signing up to sustainable development strategies and international agreements are being designed to protect and conserve 
the resources that we all share around the world. While, of course, current progress falls short of targets and even those targets we believe aren't good enough, uh, the world is nevertheless expressing um, care for the earth and for God's creation. And of course, that's so encouraging to see. Uh, and as Christian A's, um, you know, we encourage the church to be in the center of this movement towards climate justice. And we believe that by standing together, uh, we can really achieve climate justice. So how should Christians and churches respond to these measures? What does the Bible say about care for creation? What stance does God want his people to take? Well, like every good Welshman and Welshwoman, I've got three points uh, to present to you um, this evening before we split into smaller groups for discussion. Uh, and in no way I'm presenting the answers uh, this evening, I'm afraid to say, uh, but hopefully what I'll be able to share will encourage you uh, and challenge you uh, as a church, as a denomination, as individuals, um, as we face the climate crisis together. So sorry, I don't have the answers. Hopefully what I'll be sharing will challenge and encourage you. So can we have the next slide, please? Thank you very much. So these are the three things uh, I'm gonna touch on um, this evening. Um, so I'm gonna look at uh, what God says in his, in his word, um, and then what the global response is to that. And then, um, look a little bit on the local response to that, but hopefully maybe we'll cover more of the local side of things in the smaller groups um, later on. Next slide, please. So take care of it, Genesis 2, uh, 15. However, you read the first chapters uh, of Genesis, um, however you interpret it, um, God gave the first humans the mandate to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish, birds and every living thing. While the whole creation belongs ultimately to God, for he has given the earth to the sons of men, they are to subdue and rule over it by working and taking care of God has entrusted them. Now, excuse me for a second, as my 11 month old son uh, goes past me to have his bath. So there he is. <laughs> uh, so maybe you'll hear some background noises as he enjoys uh, splashing in the bath. So the verb um, to work and to take care of are also coupled together to describe the nature of the priestly service in the tabernacle, uh, which centered on the worship of God, of course, on behalf of the people of Israel. So this suggests then, doesn't it, that human work in the garden has and had a priestly dimension because they are made in God's image and likeness, humans also function as God's representatives in creation. They deputize for God, if you like, as their ambassadors in working and taking care of the garden in God's way, they would be obedient representatives. So the first humans then, were given privileges and responsibilities to care for creation as priest kings. They would have freedom to use their creative gifts to find fulfillment and joy in their work and enjoy time for rest, giving thanks and praise to God for all that he had given them. Humanity's care for creation mattered to God. He valued his creation. He saw it as very good. His care for it was not arbitrary. He had long-term plans for it. 
It was made to glorify him. He loved it. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all he has made. And he privileged human beings to share in his love, care and concern for his creation. Again, I'm not here to tell you how to read the few first chapters of Genesis, but according to the narrative, things changed with the fall. When Adam wanted to be as God and decide for himself what was right and wrong, grasping at moral autonomy, God put Adam and Eve out of the garden. God cursed the ground because of Adam subjecting it to frustration. From now on, it would grow thorns and thistles. Something has gone wrong. And as humans spread, so did the frustration of creation. Human wickedness reached such a level that God destroyed virtually all life on earth in the flood. According to the story, only Noah, his family, and a variety of animals were preserved. Yet God renewed his covenant with creation and his mandate for creation care through Noah. So land was under frustration, under a curse, but God renewed his covenant for creation. Next slide, please. Jason, lovely. And the mandate for creation um, care in the New Testament is implied rather than explicit. Jesus explains God's underlying and continu continuing care for his creation in the way he feeds the birds, clothes the lilies and the grass of the field and knows the falling of a sparrow. God's care is detailed in the New Testament. Next slide, please. Jesus himself will obey his father to death on the cross. In so doing, he will serve and redeem not only the human race, but creation as well. Creation is part of God's redemption plan. All things were created by him and for him. In him, they hold together. And through him, God reconciles them to himself. Through Jesus' resurrection, God secures the immense regeneration and renewal, not only of individuals who are new creations, but of the whole cosmos. Then the meek will inherit the earth, freed from its present frustration. In the meantime, however, each individual must develop the mind of Christ and in the image of God, learning to serve their Father in heaven with humble obedience, which will include caring for his creation. Even if the task today appears more demanding than it was in Eden, the mandate from God has not changed. As a royal priesthood, the sons of God, Christians, his church, represent God, their father, to creation. They exercise their priestly service through ministering the gospel to the world. And in the new covenant, they function as salt, not only to preserve the truth, but also to preserve God's creation. And in the new earth, their works here will follow them. Next slide, please. So what does that look like in practice then? Well, hopefully we'll be exploring more of that tonight. But simply to begin with, by looking at uh, these few things from scripture, it means standing with people from all faiths and none for climate justice. It means speaking for those who cannot defend themselves, including plants and animals 
as well as humans. Christians will show mercy to a drained planet against the tyrannical demands of an exploitive humanity by walking humbly with God. Christians will teach the world that planet Earth is not to be thoughtlessly exploited for selfish ends. The Father's love and care for his creation must be taught and lived out through humble obedience to him as his people in fulfilment of the royal priestly service offered to him in Christ. Well, that's my overview of climate justice and the Bible. What then of our global response? What do we do of all this? Well, COVID has shown us, how long has it taken me to mention COVID? 10 minutes, maybe? <laughs> COVID has shown us how interconnected we all are today. It has shown us how locally, nationally, globally, we're all connected. Indeed, we're all neighbours on a global scale. COVID has shown how there's been so much caring for one another in our communities here in Wales and, and the UK, and also how we need to and should care for our global neighbours too. It's shown how interconnected we are by the spread of the virus, of course, and the debate about how the poorest communities can access the vaccine. And of course, the implications for those in rich countries if they don't. This and really what we saw in scripture leads to the issue of recovery and what recovery should look like. And I'm going to share with you how Christian Aid and our partners, what we're doing um, in order to, su to support communities around the world today uh, by focusing uh, on Ethiopia. Um, if that's okay, in particular. So our climate work in Ethiopia then. Christian Aid, we've worked in Ethiopia um, and we're working there with 10 partners at the moment with programmes focusing on resilient and inclusive markets, climate change, um, emergency response and gender and inequality. Our um, one local program, sorry, um, is Braced, which focuses on working with pastoral and agro-pastoral communities. So Braced works with farmers, uh, herders and other vulnerable groups to build resilience to climate extremes and disasters, including droughts, floods and extreme temperature. Excuse me. going to close the door. And um, Braced, they uh, prioritise work with women in its climate response, uh, as women tend to put the children and other family members over themselves when food is scarce. Women also tend to take on additional activities uh, like fetching water and small trading to earn more money uh, to support their families. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna introduce you to some individuals um, we work with um, in Ethiopia to highlight uh, our work there in terms of climate justice. So Mekonen so far is pictured here uh, with some of his uh, cows. And he kneels in the sand, determinedly digging with his uh, hands and a bucket into the dirt of the dry riverbed in search of water. He's thirsty and desperate with a dry hole uh, more than a meter deep um, by the time he finishes here. McConnen knows that if he does not strike water today, some of his livestock may die. 
the effects of climate change are real uh, in the village where Mekonen lives with his wife and five sons. The rains have stopped, drought has dried the river, and crops no longer produce a harvest. Even the honeybees have disappeared. The conditions have become unbearable. McConnell knows his way of life as a pastoralist herdsman will not last much longer as the climate crisis worsens these conditions. Many of his livestock have already died and hunger has forced him to sell off some of his remaining animals to feed his family. Yet in the face of prolonged drought, he persists. Next slide, please. McConnen recalls stories of friends and fellow herdsmen who have dug so deep to find water that they are killed by collapsing sand. A number of people have died because when they excavate, they dig deep with sand above their head and the sand collapses on top of them, even small children. We pray for rain, but when there's no rain, we have to dig. McConnell explains. Some people have shovels, but most don't. We use our hands. The changing climate has made it too difficult to live around here. I am losing all my resources. My farm and my animals are no longer enough. Next slide, please. McConnell desperately needs a reliable water source to keep his animals alive and maintain his livelihood. Each day that passes is another day of digging, another day of desperation. And this is the reality of communities living on the front line of climate change. Next slide, please. Kawite here rises with the sun to gather water for her family from the community pond, pictured behind her. In the morning light, both her pregnant belly and warm smile glow in expectation. Hope has returned to a community like a spring in the desert. Today, Kawite will make breakfast for her family, send her youngest children to school, and tend to a business of trading goats and sheep. After she completes her chores, she'll meet with a community savings group to dream of ideas to empower other women in a village to thrive like she is. Kawite's smile does not always shine so brightly. For the past 10 years, Kawite's family struggled to make ends meet as the effect of the climate crisis ravaged her village with prolonged drought and hardship. Next slide, please. When I was young, the wells were full and going to collect water didn't take much time, she explained. When the climate changed and the rain stopped, the water disappeared. Kawita and her daughters traveled up to five hours every day to fetch water and the children often missed school or went hungry. As the burden of prolonged drought became unbearable, Christian Aid and our local partner Braced worked alongside Kawita's community, supporting the village to build their own pond that serves as the village's water source. Next uh, slide, please. Kawita and the community were provided with drought resistant seeds to boost the harvest, elephant grass to feed the livestock, and goats and sheep to help the women build livelihoods. The women in the community have also established a saving group, pictured here, as a way to provide loans to women and empower the community from within. The community pond saves Kawita hours of precious time. She can spend at home now with a family. And the other support from Christian A's partner has empowered her to put food on the table 
and build a better future for a community, her 10 children and her baby on the way. The pond is not only for me, it has changed the life of this village. Next slide, please, and the last uh, story I'll share with you tonight. In Ethiopia, as we know in Wales, uh, hand washing is so important these days. And in Ethiopia, soap is not only helping fight off further spread of the virus pandemic, soap is also changing lives by empowering women to fight the effects of the climate crisis and become self-reliant. Next slide, please. Kumana here is an entrepreneur and a mother of three. Though she didn't finish school herself, she's doing everything in her power to make sure her own children get an education. Thanks to training from Christian Aid and a local partner, she now has a thriving aloe vera soap making business that empowers her to build that hope into reality. Christian Aid's partner provides the soap making training using the drought resistant aloe vera plant that was native to the area and thrived in the climate where other crops failed. When we relied only on crop production to feed our families, things were too hard. The rain has become so little we only have one decent harvest every three years, Kaman explained. Everyone is searching for additional income because it is the only way we can survive. The money from our soap production is not only for food, but also for clothes and teaching materials for my children. Everything was covered by my husband before. Now it's part of the whole household livelihood. We need support for other women so they can be like us, she shared with us. Next slide, please. The production of soap has not only helped Kumana and the women become more financially dependent and less reliant on men, it has multiplied the sources of income generation for the whole village and the district. Because of the soap, many more people travel to our village, then buy other goods as well. The soap helps all of the businesses earn extra income, she shared with us. Next slide, please. Beyond the much needed extra income that the aloe soap production provides, having unlimited access to soap, greatly benefits the health of the village as well, improving hygiene and hand washing. Well, I hope these stories has demonstrated the need for us to care for creation and care for one another in the fight against climate change and in the fight for climate justice. I hope it shows you how Christian Aid and our partners, uh, through your generosity, can strengthen communities in the face of the climate crisis. Well, what can we do locally then? What can we do locally? Next slide, please. Well, at Christian Aid, we always talk of three ways to respond. Give act and pray. Now I'm not here to ask for money, but I hope these stories I've shared from Ethiopia has demonstrated how your donations and your fundraising um, is used in the communities where we work. But something else you can give is your time. Uh, and we're always looking for volunteers uh, to help us do our work, be that a volunteer speaker going into churches and schools to share about our work, or we're always looking for volunteers for our national office in Cardiff, um, if you want to do some uh, admin or help out like that when the office 
opens and when it's safe to do so. Act. Uh, well, we there's many ways you can act and campaign with Christian Aid. Um, there's a new deal for climate justice petition on our website. You can sign and support. And our current economic system is broken, uh, isn't it? Uh, it's driving inequality, poverty, and the climate crisis. You know, poverty is political. Um, no one in the world should live in poverty, but they do. Uh, from indigenous communities whose homes have been destroyed to farming communities devastated by drought, like I've just shared, the most marginalized are suffering worst. Uh, we're calling politicians to act now to build a better world where everyone can flourish and calling supporters to sign the petition, which you can find online. Uh, and another way, of course, you can act is through the Eco Church scheme. You know, Eco Church is a great way, isn't it, to model local responses and show that we're thinking differently about the future. Uh, and I believe campaigning is a part of the Eco Church's accreditation, isn't it? So please stand with us in our campaign for a new deal for climate justice. And there'll be other ways and plenty of ways to campaign uh, as we look forward to COP26 next autumn, of course. And the third thing you can do is pray. This year is crucial in the struggle for climate justice to rise to the challenge I think, and Christian, I think we need to underpin it with prayer. Prayer that will amplify prophetic voices and transform us and the actions that we take. Prayer that will help us to understand God's care for those who are most affected by the climate crisis. Acknowledge our role in causing it and start anew. Prayer that will act as a deep source of energy for the struggle ahead. Uh, and alongside our friends at CAFOD, CAFOD and TIA Fund uh, and people all over the world, uh, we're going to try and fill every day with prayer for a world where everyone can flourish and creation can breathe easy again. So if the URC and the Synod of Wales wants to get um, involved with this, then you can sign up on the calendar um, of the prayer chain uh, to fill a time slot to pray either by yourself or with others from your church. Choose whether you wish to pray as a one-off or on a regular basis and sign up online through uh, our website. Well, I think that's enough uh, from me. Uh, so hopefully um, you've been encouraged and challenged, and now for the really meaty part of the evening, I think, the small group discussion. So uh, back over to you, um, Jason, I believe. Thank you very much, Ken. That, that is uh, very thought-provoking uh, and moving. Uh, I'm going to straight away put you into uh, your breakout groups uh, to discuss. What will happen is you'll be you'll be put into your breakout groups. You'll have 15 minutes. You won't facilitate it. You don't need to time anything or worry about that. Adrian will sort all that out um, and uh, give you a, a minute's warning when it's going to when your 15 minutes is going to be up. Uh, when uh, you come out of your breakout group, if you want to just mute yourself and turn your camera off for five minutes and have a stretch and a spin round and a glass of water or something, uh, and we'll have a five minute break. OK, so uh, enjoy and see you soon. Okay, so um, we're going to have a bit of feedback from our breakout rooms and just have a kind of feel for the conversations that you are having and any questions that you might have. I think what we'll do is we'll gather all those that uh, information and then I'll ask uh, Cannon if he wants to respond to maybe some of the questions that have come out from those breakout rooms um, before he um, 
then goes into a final um, discussion. I know Eileen wants to um, do a couple of notices before that happens. But um, so I'm going to ask um, the, the groups that were doing set one questions, the questions in set one, which were Liz's group and Janet's group, if they could feedback first so we got a feel for what the conversation is now. I don't know if you would have got through all three questions. I know certainly in my group, we didn't get through all three questions. So uh, let's go. Liz, do you want feedback from your group? Um, well, um, we, we had a good discussion. Um, our first question was about whether or not a local community, uh, sorry, a local ecumenical action concerning the environment and climate justice could be undertaken. And if so, what would we do? Um, there were a number of um, examples of things that cropped up, probably stretching the ecumenical more into sort of community type activities. Um, a number of things that had grown up locally uh, where groups had worked together, um, a green eco day, for example, online talks and uh, of involving different community groups and churches. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, for example, tackling issues like single use masks that have been littering the place yeah. um, and, also, and all sorts of things like that, community events. Um, ecumenical, um, a lot of that work has been set back quite a bit by the COVID and by other things that happen in churches from time to time, that off, it's often affected by mm -hmm. change of ministers or other sorts of things that crop mm -hmm. up. So it seemed to us that the, the community was, the, the, in the examples we had, that the actual community involvement um, was a, was a critical issue really um, yeah. ecumenical we didn't cover so much so that so that was the first um, the, the first uh, question that we had but okay. um, definitely trying to use um, the eco issues as a theme in any joint activity the church and Cumbran for example had planned an eco service and um, for their mm. joint ecumenical service but uh -huh, a lot uh -huh. of the time certainly in our experience in Beulah I, there is an ecumenical thread to this but it also involves the community and festivals and special uh -huh. days when we'd all be there pushing our corner on each other. Yeah, yeah. so that was the first one okay. and the second one we I'll come back to the global stage we talked about um, MPs and AMs and thought a little bit about what motivated um, people like that to get involved how do you get them involved mm. And um, again, in our experience, it often is about involving them because you, if you give them a platform, they do want to meet people, they do want to meet the community, and then you can expect them to do something and follow it up. Mm -hmm. um, so That's we could, in case of really, um, invite them to everything, um, send them everything, lobby them, write to them, help them to um, do things that they want to do locally. We've got a North Cardiff. Um, eco group that's being set up by our local MP so we want to mm -hmm. work to support that and the hope yeah, yeah. also without being cynical that um, they will support us in our development so mm -hmm. a lot of um, really letting them know and using the Christian aid materials particularly often there are postcards there are materials for contacting your local um, MPs. A, a, an additional complication in Wales, of course, is knowing what's devolved and what isn't, and whether it's mm, Welsh Office of or, well, what, sorry, Welsh Assembly, Senate, or whether it's national, and is it the MP or the M, and, and you just have to trap them all in. Um, yeah, yeah. We started to look at what, uh, whether we could do other things in raising money, mm -hmm. um, in terms of, rather than just raising money for Christian Aid and Climate Coalition, but really, um, I can't imagine why you would do anything without Christian Aid and Climate Coalitions, really. There's so yeah. much good material. There's so much that you can use mm -hmm. and wonderful mm -hmm. people that come and coming out to speak, maybe, and support. So we didn't really get to cover that one very much. Janet, um, George, feedback from your group. Thank you very much. Um, we had Catherine from Mould telling us about a plastic reduction group they've got in the town which they've signed up and committed to. Uh, it was started by the local council that includes churches, um, businesses, cafes, all kinds of things like that. Mm -hmm. And then John from Utoxeter um, works with the West Midlands Synod um, and represents churches together on the town council biodiversity committee. Mm. Now, Personally, I'd have to find out if Swansea had a biodiversity committee because I have no idea. 
So they've done a little pick in tree planting, and I love this one. They've made a map of the area, um, and they ask people when they're out walking um, of sightings of things, for example, hedgehogs. Mm. And then they put uh, on this map so they can try and make wildlife corridors where hedgehogs have been seen, um, that kind of thing. Um, they've got a building in the town centre, which is a, a recycling base where they sell eco-friendly products. Um, and they happen to have a local big business. Remind me what it was called, John, please. JCB, I think JCB, it was. JCB, JCB, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the diggers. Um, yeah. So then we went on uh, to the... Um, second question slightly about mm. climate justice and uh you know making sure you're up to date with arosha's website and christian aid's website mm. Mm. Uh, and helping my work in through them mm -hmm. but at the end we had um no i can't see him on the screen miara from mid wales originally from madagascar and this really interested me because um an english teacher i had in school started a charity money for madagascar um, and we raised money when I was a pupil, and then I went on to raise money uh, when I was teaching. And he's on the National Committee for Christian Aid. And this was really his heartfelt plea. Hmm. We need to know real information from people living in Madagascar, actually spending their whole lives there. For instance, he said there are over a million people in Ma in Malaga Madagascar or Malagasy as it's some you know with malnutrition which doesn't get into the news mm. and that really hit home to me mm. Mm. I think for me that was the most important thing that came out of our discussion unfortunately it was right at the end mm. so he might want to talk to us a little bit more about that hello everyone hi Miara I am um, Miara. I'm, I'm, I'm from Madagascar. And um, the sad things for me um, is you will never uh, hear any news about a country like Madagascar. And there's a lot of poor countries um, that are really affected by climate change but also severe poverty, not, not mm -hmm. necessarily because of war, but mainly now it's because of climate change. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are affected in the world, especially in my place in Madagascar, but you won't find any information about that in the mainstream media here. And, and it's something that's really sad because People here will will not hear the voice of the poor, the voice of people, who, the struggling people, mm -hmm. and, and what what we really need to to build this is how do we connect with those people? We are, for example, we we are very fortunate. We have Christian aid, for example, but unfortunately, Christian aid is not working in Madagascar, but we, we've got, at least we've got Christian aid to work with other countries, but I think we can contact those um, countries like Madagascar through our connection with the Council for World Mission, for example, because church in Madagascar is, um, is a partner church of the URC here. Mm -hmm. So how do we get, um, um, real information from them is by contacting the church down in Madagascar. What's happening in your country? What can we do? Can we, how can we pray for each other and mm. to, to get that real information so that people understand the need? Because the thing is that like, what affects Madagascar with climate change? Although mm. it's, a, it's, a, it's an island, in the middle of the ocean, far from far from here, mm. is eighty percent of our um, fauna and flora is very endemic to Madagascar. So once they are gone, they are gone. So it's not only 
the Malagasy people who is going to miss that, it's all of us all mm. here in this world that we are going to miss it. So mm. if we don't act now, if we don't help each other, then things will go very wrong. Uh, that's, that's so true. Thank you, Mar uh, Miara. It's a fascinating conversation. Um, I'm going to stop you there. Um, because I want to hear from the other groups and, and their questions. So could I have um, can I, uh, Helen's uh, group, feedback from Helen's group, please? <laughs> um, we had done that that same set of questions. I'm not quite sure why, but anyway, All I right. caught on them. Um, the first one about ecumenical work, uh, the, the response was mixed. Some people um, had various things going on and found the eco-church um, structure useful mm -hmm. um, in, in um, promoting that. Other people found that it, it was difficult with all the other things you were promoting in, in church life yeah. um, to include um, work on climate change. And um, I think the, the main thing we came up with, which really follows on from what the other people have said, is that uh, information and giving other people information about an awareness of what the situations are and what causes um, the fact that people to be hungry and uh, yeah. there to be poverty and illness. Um, because as the last speaker said, there's little known about um, a lot of areas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, using um, speakers and materials from organizations like Christian Aid uh, is is very useful okay. and that's the useful thing we can do i think that was the right. main point that we okay have. um and Anne's group yeah right um we were on um set two and the first mm -hmm. question has your church campaigned with organizations such as christian aid and the climate coalition yeah uh, and share the ways this has been done um people felt that they certainly contributed to Christian Aid and groups like that by raising money. Christian Aid was mentioned and was supported by a number of people. I think the word campaigned was perhaps a bit intimidated for some people, yeah. but it was pointed out because um, Kenan was in our group that that doesn't mean marching down the streets with banners. It can be lobbying your MPs or your AMs or whoever and somebody else mentioned that you often get for some campaigns a postcard produced by various organizations mm -hmm. that just have to be signed and sent off mm -hmm. so yeah it's not necessarily you writing an email whatever another member of our group wondered how effective these sorts of campaigns, sending letters and postcards and so on were, but um, Canon felt that they do make a difference, that it is worth doing, which was very useful to know. Mm. Uh, mm. We went on to question two about changing your lifestyle and the way your church is run. Um, people uh, do tend to do things like um, using low energy light bulbs, um, trying to use green energy tariffs, yeah. um, yeah. turning down the heating was mentioned, although that can cause problems with some members of the congregation <laughs> who complain <laughs> then that it's too cold. So I'm sure many people will be aware of that situation. Mm. Um, plastics, the use of plastics was mentioned. Um, uh, for example, we don't use disposable cups or anything in after, in after service events, but we wondered how um, camp, how we could try and um, promote or encourage um, supermarkets and, and various organisations not to use so much plastic. Mm -hmm. And we didn't come up with an answer okay. to that, but it was yeah. just one of those things. We didn't get okay. on to the third question. So apologies. Okay. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. Um and uh Rosie's group. We managed to we managed to get through uh most of them. 
Um, oh. First question we were looking at was, um, did were, would we consider getting actively involved in organisations such as Christian Aid, Arosha and Climate Stewards to make a change to our world? And I think the consensus with most people was that we were already um, using a lot of material from these um, places, uh, particularly Christian Aid. Um, Eileen mentioned the materials from Arosha on their website and there's some amazing um, sort of things that you can use to actually encourage and infuse about. Um, yeah. There. Uh, so I think, you know, there was um, fairly, in a, in a fairly small way, I think most people were doing something, even if it's just volunteering for Christian aid or uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. It was, it was really felt that we could really, uh, it would really help to have um, Canon's presentation so that we could share it wider because uh, it was, it was really inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, I'm not very good at names. We, the, the, uh, one of our group um, was mentioned that they choose an appeal every year, um, a cow campaign, for example, with children raising money to send a cow mm -hmm. and, and little campaigns like that actually connect people because they're quite personal. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when you're actually seeing something tangible, it really can connect you with what you're doing rather than something just just an appeal. It, it, that, that sort of personal thing was really important. Mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned that we, we've done something quite recently in, in Barrie. Um, we haven't got our uh, church building done yet, but we've already twinned our toilets with um... <laughs> <laughs> So we've got five toilets twinned from various places all over the world. And we're getting very excited about going into our toilets in our new building when we finally open at some point. Um, being You're going able to give to birth to toilets then. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> But there was a there was some conversations going about how you know if you're in a village situation somebody mentioned oh I can't, I'm sorry about names I'm not very good um, that maybe if you went to the community council or town council and they had some toilets they it would be good to get them to cut twin toilets because uh -huh. then you're moving out beyond the church boundary and uh, that's one thing so that it was quite exciting ah oh, uh, great. <laughs> And we didn't really have very much else. I think we were talking about some of the things that people have been involved in, such as transition okay. towns and guerrilla gardening and, yeah. and other things. We didn't really have enough time. <laughs> no, I know. We're running out of time here as well. Um, Sorry. And so, so um, I don't know, Conan, if you want to kind of just come back to any of these. Yeah, no questions, which is great, but lots of food for thought. And that, that um, you know, the word campaign and campaigning uh, was uh, discussed in our group and what that actually looks like, um, you know, a, a small signature or a signed postcard um, does go a long way. So um, an example of this, for example, last Friday, um, we um, presented um, the New Deal for Climate Justice petition as it stands at the moment, although that's ongoing. So we presented the Prime Minister with 57,000 signatures um, alongside um, a signed letter from uh, 48 senior um, church leaders from the Archbishop of Canterbury to Rev Simon Walkling of the Synod um, of Wales, URC, uh, you know, so that's that's really amplifying all our voices. That what a signed postcard does. Another example: um, a few years ago, we were lobbying HSBC uh, yeah. with with other members of the Climate Coalition, asking them to divest their uh, investments from fossil fuel to renewable energies, and they did, mm -hmm. and and they and they mentioned the lobbying campaign we were part of. So it really does make a mis uh, it really does make a difference, and what it does is giving voice to the voiceless, as Miara mentioned, mm -hmm. communities in Madagascar and communities where Christian aid work. You know, a part of our role uh, as as Christian aid supporters, as campaigners, is to give voice to the voiceless, mm -hmm. um, and you can do that. Um, by using our resources, you know, showing pictures, showing faces of real people we are supporting, mm -hmm. using videos um, where you can, you know, hear their voices. Um, and also, um, 
in the new year, um, Christian Aid Wales, uh, we're planning on putting on a series of webinars um, leading up to Christian Aid Week, where we'll be inviting partners from the communities where we work to be part of those webinars uh, and you know th there'll be invitation for you all to join those yeah. uh, where you can meet and hear from people from these communities oh that's great thank you um, when you reap the harvest of your land do not reap up to the edge of your field do not glean bare your vineyard nor shall you gather the fallen grape. But leave them for the poor and the stranger, for I am the Lord your God. I wonder, is this the way that you see that command of God played out? just as it was in Ruth. The gleaning from the edge of the field, leaving it for the poor and the stranger. Or maybe you see it like this. Gleaning from the edge of the field, leaving something for the poor and the stranger, like this. The bits that we leave at the edge of our field for the poor and the stranger. Maybe this. The bits that we leave at the edge of our field God doesn't tell us how much to leave. God leaves that to you. How big is the edge of your field, our field? Someone once suggested that the size of the edge of your field is the size of your heart. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the privilege of being able to meet together as your people to meet with you and to turn to you to be challenged Holy Spirit by you and to be changed we pray for the people of Ethiopia the people of Madagascar people all over this world, some of whom are gleaning from the edges of our fields all the rubbish that we leave behind. Some have not even got anywhere to glean from, desperately digging for water. Lord, help us in any way that we can. to be the people who care for your world in a priestly way and honour and glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, Amen. Oh, oh, oh.
out of poverty is born a dream that will not die and landless weary folk find strength to stand with heads held high it's then we learn from those who wait to greet the promised day the lord is coming don't lose heart be blessed prepare the way Forget to share their bread. They find their wealth an empty thing. Their spirits are not fed. For only just and tender love, the hungry soul will stay. And so God's prophets echo still, be blessed, prepare the way. Let's share the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all. Lovely to see you all. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the welcome. Thank you, Ken. And uh, safe drive home, everybody. <laughs> well, a safe walk up the stairs, unless you live in a bungalow or a flat. <laughs> or you're upstairs already. Yeah. Good night and God bless. And uh, see you soon. See you. Bye. God bless. Bye.